Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Bill Lester here with Hernando County Extension Service. And we have kind of a full house this morning. Uh, <laughs> my regular co-host, Lily Browning, with uh, Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape is here today. Good morning, Lily. How are you? I'm good, Bill. How are you? I'm just great. I guess you're back from the, the great white north. Almost I am. White. I am. And um, speaking of the great white north, as soon as I settled in my airplane seat on Sunday, I did a double take out the window. It was flurrying. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was like, Time to leave. And <laughs> yeah, I think snow would kill me at this point. So um, it was one of those grain snow mixes, you know, really gray. And so uh -huh. beautiful weather since I've gotten back to Florida, too. So nice. Yeah. And no snow here. Some <laughs> a little bit of weather, but no snow. Yeah. <laughs> and also this morning, we have a special guest, Teresa Bajurek from Pinellas County Extension. Morning, Teresa. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing great. I, I'm excited to be here with you guys. This is a fun format. It is. Yeah, it's worked out pretty well so far. Um, everybody on uh, our Facebook page can see us. Everybody on our Facebook group can see it. Everybody on YouTube can see it also afterwards. So, you know, if you have to step out or you miss part of it, it's recorded. So you can go back to our Facebook page and watch the entire thing all the way through or somebody mentions a product or an address or a plant or something, you can go back and, and rewatch it if you like. So yeah, it's worked out really well so far. So Teresa, why don't you let me put you on the spot and you can tell everybody <laughs> what you do down there in beautiful Pinellas County. Absolutely. So <clears throat> I have a similar job to uh, Bill Lester here and I am the Master Gardener Coordinator, the Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator in Pinellas County and we have Oh, geez. If we add the new class, we have almost 160 master gardeners that I train and coordinate, and they do all kinds of fun projects in the community. And I'm also the urban horticulture agent. So when you have questions about your landscape, or your lawn, your trees, you come to me and my staff and my help desk, and we do our best to help you figure out how to make your landscape beautiful and environmentally friendly at the same time. Have you seen since COVID first started, gosh, however many months ago, <laughs> back in March, April, did the number of questions your office got increase? So uh, I wouldn't say the number increased, actually, but because we our building has been closed and is still closed. So oh. it just changed entirely from a mix of phone and email and walk-in clients to being almost entirely email and a few, some people still call by phone. Um, but we don't have a building that's open to visit yet. So it's just really shifted. Yeah. Um, but the kinds of questions have changed. Yeah, we saw the same thing. We saw a big shift to, um, well, first of all, because when things yeah. were initially shut down, a lot of people found themselves at home and they got bored. And I guess they went outside and started working in their yards. And we saw the number of emails go up, phone calls go up. Uh, we get questions through Facebook. So for anybody watching today, if you have a question, you can um, email us through Facebook and attach pictures. So we've been doing a lot more um, problem solving and identifying things through pictures as opposed to people bringing in jars with bugs and leaves and and weird fruits and things like that. Right. I do sort of miss that, though. Um, yeah, yeah. The picture's not the same, but it, it helps, you know. <laughs> Yeah, because I've seen every insect imaginable come in in every container imaginable to the office. <laughs> Keeps things interesting. It's true. It's true. We've, we've known how to use personal protective equipment for a long time before COVID, haven't we? <laughs> yes, we have. And we, we've always had gloves and other equipment at the office because people bring in some really unusual things to be identified. <laughs> I know um, a gentleman with parks department with city of Brooksville called up one day and said that they had an unusual bee that was making holes in the ground at the playground there. And I said, well, I need to see what it looks like. Can you get a picture or catch one? He said, yeah, we'll get one and bring it by and hung up. So about an hour later, they pop in the office and they had a bee in a Gatorade bottle. How they got it in there, I still, I never really did figure out. I was always very impressed that they were able to do it. 
They it must, must or, have or, or, banged on the ground or did something. I'm not <laughs> sure what. Or it was attracted to the Gatorade in the bottle, even. Yeah, the sugar. Maybe? Yeah. That could be, but I'm thinking I yeah. probably no, would. No, they held it in there that. before they got the lid on, is what I thought. <laughs> 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 Well, it turned out that they were beneficial horse guard wasps, cool. which is a wasp that goes around, that flies around and catches horse flies. And they take them back to their little individual, their solitary ground dwelling bees and take horse flies back down into their hole and lay eggs into it. So it was beneficial, but they had their little holes in the, uh, right by the swing set at the park. So <laughs> that presented a little bit of a safety issue with the kids. So. But we were able to identify it for him, and I got an actual sample for my collection too. So <laughs> you kept it, huh? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, I, I have a collection. We keep it for training master gardeners, and also um, we need to put together a separate collection for the office with the most common pest insects that people bring in to be identified. Things like uh, lover grasshoppers and chidera bugs and things like that. Bill has the a, usuals. Yeah, he has a whole collection of bodies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and um, type them in the chat box. Cindy's here this morning. So good morning, Cindy. How are you? So Teresa, what are the yeah. most common questions you're getting now, either through email or on the phone? So the most popular or common questions we're getting a lot of right now are um, a lot of people wanting to know about growing vegetables. There are a good number of folks who tried to do that um, right when the lockdown or the shut-in or whatever we call it started back in March. And as you guys know, um, you know, getting a start in March here in Florida is pretty late in the season, right? So mm -hmm. there's very little, and especially for us in Pinellas County, we're zone 10 mostly. Um, it can be really, really challenging to try to grow stuff that late. So we had a lot of people and I said, well, so now's a great time to plan, right? And so now they're, yeah. they're growing fall stuff. And so yeah. a lot of questions about that and what's this eating on this and why isn't this getting pollinated? And I would say that's the biggest thing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a steady stream of vegetable gardening questions and we have the same issue because exactly when everybody got locked down was kind of the very end of spring planting here. Unless yeah. you want to grow okra. It was good yeah. time to go plant okra. <laughs> yes. If you want okra, you are so in business in the summer here, but exactly. not too many people. I mean, some people like okra, but there's also only so much okra, I'm assuming, <laughs> that one household needs. Well, you know, you can pick them. <laughs> Pickled okra is very good. You can, if you know what you're doing. And, and uh, uh -huh. I, I don't know if you guys have any canning classes over there. We don't oh, have those do. over here. Do you? Yeah. yeah, we have an entire cannery. Oh, you guys are lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't yeah. have, um, right now we don't have a family and consumer sciences agent. Um, so we don't have any kind of food preservation classes happening locally. Although I have shared, I've seen different ones throughout the state, you know, online now that we're online. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that other counties have it. Um, but we're missing that right now for sure. Yeah, Hernando County has had a cannery since um, I'm sure it was set up as like a victory garden thing, if not before the 40s, it's been there. And it's kind of sometimes it's open, sometimes it's not, depending on if they find someone to run it. But we have, isn't it uh, the doctor who's running it now, Bill, or is it somebody else now? No, it's Hernando County Growers Association. Oh, okay. But anyway, they are, and and they are offering classes there currently. Yeah. And so you can do all your canning there and not mess up your kitchen. And, and, and it's quicker because they have, you know, some bigger equipment and everything. And um, they were recently had classes on making beauty berry jelly and jam. And so, yeah. So I almost did that at home. I didn't do it, though, <laughs> because I didn't have any pectin at the house. Uh, and I, I went to, to the grocery store like three times and didn't write it on the list and forgot. And then I sort of said, oh, well, now my beauty berries aren't looking so good anymore. They don't look like jelly making berries anymore. Yeah, you probably need a lot of beauty berries to make it worth your while. Uh, I have sugar. a lot. <laughs> you need a lot of sugar to make it worth your while. Yeah, um, yeah. 
In so fact, I tell people, if you put enough sugar in, that fixes pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in one of my classes, I didn't know where the question came from until I realized I had talked about vegetable gardening. I touched on it. One of the questions was, where can you find canning jars? And I was like, what? <laughs> but apparently, what? apparently, because like you said, this all fits together. This is what people were doing now. So people were buying the canning jars and, you know, it was hard to find them. But I guess Walmart and like Dollar General still had some. So Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> Although some of the things that were popular during the original part of the shutdown, if you went on Amazon, they would they had them and they were like, we'll ship it in November. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when it was April. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, we're a little backed up. Toilet paper is out of stock at the moment. <laughs> but if yeah, anybody really, has your any canning in, supplies later. Yeah, if you have any questions about the uh, Little Rock Cannery, if you go ahead and call our office and there's the phone number right there. Uh, Teresa can put you in contact with them and give you their contact information. If, if you haven't been out there before, it's a great place to visit. And they do have the large industrial equipment. So if you wanted to can, you know, a hundred jars of tomato sauce or something like that, if you had a really bumper crop of tomatoes this year, they can help you out. They have the, the correct equipment and they'll make sure that you do it safely also because you really want to know what you're doing when it comes to canning certain things before you jump right into it. Otherwise it may not work out really well. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's little building. Difficult. It's a little building made of old fashioned, uh, you know, chunky lime rocks, hence its name. They don't can little rocks, nor are they in. <laughs> <little rock. laughs> I'm glad you explained that. I thought, I wonder why it's called that. We're in Florida. <laughs> That sounds like a great, a uh, great facility there. Is, yeah, we've actually we've held on um, compost workshops and rainbow workshops there, haven't we? Were you there with me, Bill? Yes, yes, I, I did yeah. a workshop there before. Oh yeah, right. Yes, we were there. Yeah, and it was haunted. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. We have some questions rolling in now. So, Carol Ann, one of our regulars. Good morning, Carol. How are you? says that her hibiscus is leggy but still blooming well do they go dormant so i can trim it down anybody want to give this one a shot i know what i would do because i have a one hibiscus right out front kind of squeezed right up against the front of the house it came with the house i didn't do you live in my house bill <laughs> i have that too <laughs> yeah. and i have a queen palm tree that's planted just close enough to the house and it's at that height where the oh, low no. lay on the roof and I'm like, I shouldn't trim it off because it's still green, but it is laying on the roof. So I'm going to have to trim it off. So yeah, I wouldn't have picked that exact spot for it. No, we don't always inherit what we want, do we? <laughs> exactly. I think that we would do it a little bit differently, but my hibiscus right up, squeezed up against the house generally does very, very well. It got really big. I was like probably a year or two behind on properly trimming it. But hibiscus can get leggy. The shadier the spot it's in, the leggier it's going to get. And yep. the sunnier the spot it's in, the less leggy it's going to get, generally. But they do go dormant here in Hernando County. We're far enough north where it goes, you know, semi-dormant during the winter, going to grow a lot slower. If the weather stays nice, it can keep flowering for a while. But what usually happens up here is we'll have enough cold weather where it's going to get at least a little bit of cold damage. So here, the best thing to do is wait until spring. Generally, some point in March, once all the freezes and frosts are over, and then prune it back and clean it up and prune it back shorter than where you ideally want it to be, and then leave it alone. Because I'm a big believer in a lot of these flowering plants. Just try your best to prune them just once a year. Because if you're out there once a month, just snip, snip, taking a little bit off, you tend to be trimming all the flower buds off, the new healthy growth off. And it's just so much better to trim it back short in the spring and then let it go for the rest of the year. It'll eventually get more buds and more flowers on it after a few months. It takes hibiscus a few months to really recover and start to flower again. But for a hibiscus, that's by far 
the easiest way to deal with it also, because I don't have time to be out there pruning stuff every month. You know, like I said, my hibiscus went probably two years before it actually got pruned recently. That's that's what I was going to say. It's too late to prune it now. They are cold sensitive and pruning will uh, encourage new growth. And then if it we do have a frost or a freeze, that new growth will be very susceptible, you know, to to damage. I've seen it get cold enough here to kill hibiscus. That just hasn't happened in quite some time. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I would wait till spring. After yeah, even here, even here where I am, I would I would hold off just on the off chance of really cold weather. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I was going to say besides the shade thing, um, because it, it, I've grown hibiscus in practically whole shade and it gets very long and leggy and that's just how it grows. Um, but the other thing is to think about how they've been pruning it. Um, and I don't know how, how if we can share a picture of this, but um, it, your hedges should be sort of wider at the bottom and narrow at the top so the sunlight can reach those lower branches, sort of like an inverted pyramid, mm -hmm. not, not too dramatic, a subtle widening at the bottom. And so when you're doing that pruning after the threat of cold, of course, when you do that, have that in mind going forward. Um, Cause it also can be that the top part of the uh, shrub could be shading the bottom part causing that legginess. Mm -hmm. So there's another tip. We have viewers, we have regulars on here from all over Florida. Oh, I've got, we've gotten a lot of uh, tropical fruit questions before from Broward County. I know that we have oh, cool. people in Ellis to tune in. So whenever we talk about cold weather, cold damage, keep in mind that, you know, Lily Iron in Hernando County, so that's, if we don't know that you're where you're from, we're kind of gearing it towards that. But yeah, Teresa, I know that we've gotten questions from Pinellas before, and it's a little bit different. How cold does it get in southern parts of Pinellas County or real close to um, the coast? It doesn't get that cold, actually. Um, I can't even remember the last time we had a, well, we had a frost maybe a couple of years ago, light frost. Uh, we don't, we haven't had a freeze probably since, I want to say like 2011-ish. It could have been 12. I could be off a year. Um, and that actually killed off a whole bunch of people try to plant things like coconut palms and really tropical things. We're a little bit too far north for those to be, you know, long term. So mm -hmm. we lost a lot of stuff where people are really pushing their limits. Um, but we do not get a lot of cold uh, evenings. The lows in the 40s is typical uh, in, when we get a winter chill. Um, occasionally, maybe the upper 30s. So... Uh -huh. Yeah, so things like orchids and some really, really tropical sensitive things we need to cover or move in. But then lately we haven't had much else, but we could, that's the thing. We're still in an area where we could, you know, still see frosts and freezes, so. Mm -hmm. And we well, would say three or four freezes a year. Um, okay. And, you know, sometimes more. And we haven't had, I keep saying, we haven't had a real winter in a, probably a decade. I mean, 17 yeah. is not unheard of up here. Mm -hmm. so, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so um, and Buddy, I don't think I've ever seen that I, here. I, I, I oh, should, yeah, we should tell Buddy, don't try planting coconut palms mm -hmm. up there in Tallahassee. It's not going to work out well, no. not even for a warm winter, probably. Yeah. Bill, can I no. try and screen share something? Sure, sure. You can give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, we'll you'll see. <laughs> Let me see. Um, oh, where to go? Well, not screen sharing what I want to share. Let me see. Um, I wanted to show a uh, graphic of the way to prune that Teresa talked about. Screen share. Yeah, I wouldn't. I haven't used this format before. I'm not brave enough to try that right now. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Oh, 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 oh. There uh, we go. What's happening? Yeah, but I'm. Whoa. Not. We're in a vortex. <laughs> yeah, that's not <laughs> what I'm looking for. Let me see if I can find it again. 
Well, go on and I'll look for it and you can okay. go on with another question. Yes, we can screen share on here, but obviously it takes a little bit of practice. Yeah, it, all the new stuff, you got to do it a few times. And yeah. I was going to add one other thing about hibiscus down here. And I said that we're zone 10 in Pinellas County, which is technically one of those like South Florida type of zones, even mm -hmm. though we're sort of central. And for those who may not know, it's St. Pete Clearwater, that's Pinellas County. Um, but we are zone 10 mostly, but the very top part of our county, including the city I live in, is 9B. So I'm in Tarpon Springs, um, the very northernmost part of our county that's still attached to the mainland Florida instead of the peninsula, the rest of our county is, does uh, tend to get a little bit colder. Um, and so we do act a little different in the north part. Um, the other thing I was going to add is that I, I don't know how harsh the cold is on hibiscus in your area, but it is very common here even after nights or whatever in the 40s, that we get a lot of leaf drop. Uh, the leaves will turn yellow and just go blah and fall off the plant. Yeah, yeah. And maybe even like, you know, 20 to 50% of them some nights if it gets cold enough. And, and that's perfectly normal. And they recover. They're just, they're just sort of freaking out from the cold. They're a little stressed. <laughs> yeah, they just have to recover after it warms yep. up. And she's in Polk County near Osceola. Okay. So, County, they're I probably a zone nine. I'm guessing. County? I think probably so. similar. Yeah. Both Polk and Osceola counties are large counties, so it depends on how far south. True. You are. And I know a lot of people get lulled into this sense of security because we haven't had a really cold winter for a couple of years. And I know even people here in Hernando County, all of a sudden, they seem to think that they're living in Miami. Yeah. And <laughs> and, uh, all kinds of different tropical things. And then every couple of years, we'll get a really bad um, cold spell. And people's crotons will freeze oh. and die. Uh, the Thai plants or tea plants, they, oh, they're always the first to be damaged. Almost <laughs> every year, they're going to lose some leaves at least. But a lot of times they'll, uh, if it gets cold enough, they'll actually freeze all the way to the ground. Okay, it's, so here, yeah, like it's rare said, for us. We got we, Annie's here from Hillsborough County. And That's my neighborhood. Here, Annie, <laughs> she's in 9B. Yep. And then we got people from Tampa here. So we have them kind of basically from all over. So Annie said that she's in Hillsborough so Teresa, we'll go ahead and give you this question since all right. know, you're kind of right between the two of us. Kind about of. the papaya plants here that I'm seeing? Yes, yeah, she's got a question about her papaya plants. She's she got new three. leaves. Of, oh, you're going to read the question. I'm sorry. Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. She's <laughs> got three young four foot high papaya plants that have new leaves that are deformed. They are curling and look strange. The fourth plant in a different location is normal. Any ideas? I have photos if necessary. So my first uh, instinct is that there might be a pest plant that was feeding on these leaves when they were emerging. And like an aphid, maybe, but it could be something else, of course, something that's feeding on the, the new leaves. And then as they emerge, they kind of stay curled up and stunted. It also could be some other things. I'd love to see some pictures if they could. Um, but that way, my first thing is look, take a look at the leaves, look underneath the leaves, get in there and investigate and see if you can see anything unusual, insects, discoloration. Um, it could certainly be other things, but that's what I would look at first. Yeah, papayas get a number of different, very small insects like white flies, mm -hmm. um, spider mites. Definitely could be spider mites, yeah. Yeah, thrips. And thrips are kind of sneaky. They'll come along and feed on the leaves when they're really tiny and just coming out and damage them. And then the thrips are pretty much gone. But that leaf, when it grows out, is going to grow out deformed and curled. So if you want to try shooting me some pictures, there's my email address, wlester at ufl.edu. I'll try to screen share them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you can practice that, right? <laughs> there we go. Yeah, Bill, you and I need to practice it because when I hit screen share, all it's showing is this screen again. It's not pulling up my PowerPoint that I wanted to show you, mm. but, which was a great UF graphic, you know, the UF graphic about how to 
you know, the shape of the pruning. Or you can just go back and watch my class that I taught yesterday. And you'll see it on there. <laughs> And Phyllis seems to be enjoying our screen sharing practice. <laughs> <laughs> and she's in my new Master Gardener class, and she's in Pennsylvania right now. Yes. And coming back to Florida December 2nd, which is probably a good time of year, because after that, it's just going to be way too cold to <laughs> live. In Sorry. Maybe Sorry. Below <laughs> 50 is cold for me. So. Yeah. I'm a native Floridian. That's cold for me, too. Phyllis needs to um, check out my yesterday's class. It's on my Facebook page. It was Florida Friendly Gardening for the Part-Time Resident. So, And but, she is. Yes. I should have consulted her <laughs> for, for, the, uh, for the class. I'm sure there's lots she can add to it. So. Well, I know this time of year is when we start getting all the phone calls from people that I've been up north all summer long, and I came back, and my lawn is dead, my tree is dead, my bushes are dead, everything is dead, whatever. What killed it? And that's kind of a hard question. If you, you know, send us good, clear pictures, or our office is open now for walk-in traffic, so please feel free. If you have something that we need to see a physical sample of, bring it by the office and leave it with Teresa, and if she can't answer it, she sends it to me. But yeah, we start to get the whole string of things that people come back and just, you know, this is dead and that's dead. My irrigation blew up and all kinds of problems they didn't know were going on that happened during the summer. And one mm -hmm. thing you always want to remember if you're up north and you come back here, check your irrigation. Because I, I one it. thing, if you got a lightning strike or if the little battery, the little battery backup has died in it. The time may be off, the unit may be off. If it got hit by lightning, I know that we didn't get hit by lightning. The next door neighbor's oak tree in the backyard did, but it broke up, it uh, damaged one of the valves in my irrigation. So you're going to have to go outside and turn it on and run through it zone by zone to make sure that everything's still in good working order. Don't assume that you know you come back from uh, Michigan or. Philadelphia or wherever you might be. She's in Harrisburg, Bill. Just because it's wet, you know, the sidewalk is wet in the morning. Oh, I guess everything's running okay. It may not be because irrigation breaks all the time. Philadelphia, yeah, we have not Philadelphia. I keep telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> he asks me what's the difference. I say about three hours. <laughs> it's like the difference for us. Yeah. Um, but we have the same thing here. So birds come back and have all sorts of questions. We like to joke, it's like psychic horticulture. They call, I have that shrub with the, you know, the one with the green leaves and it flowers all the time. Um, it doesn't look so good. You're like, well, I think I'm gonna need a picture, or bring it on by. But yeah, they people go away for six months and, and all kinds of stuff happens. When you have a property, um, the people that you pay to mow the lawn uh, run over your sprinkler heads, you know, um, maybe you paid them, maybe you paid someone to fertilize and take care of stuff. I've had some people come back and they paid folks to like treat the yard and, and fertilize and do all kinds of stuff. And they've come back to a jungle. Right. And they said, I can't even get in my backyard because it was, so, it grew so wild while I was gone. Mm -hmm. And so we get all kinds of fun questions this time of the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I, I like the ones where they either give you a call or send you a picture of something that's totally and completely dead. And they say, what's wrong with it? It's, it's dead. dead. <laughs> what Forensic horticulture. Forensic yeah. horticulture. I like that. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of our job, too. Although, you know, then it's a lot of like, what happened? What do you know? And then we just try and sort of work backwards and try mm -hmm. to problem solve. We're not really diagnosing anymore. We're just yeah. trying to get it what what it could have been and things to look for in the future because that's still valuable, even though we're we have to be clear that this is only a guess <laughs> based on what you've told me you did <laughs> or didn't do. But yeah, we get a lot of that. River County is also um, offering snowbird gardening classes. They had some what about a month ago, Bill, that we watched. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And now they're offering it again, I think, evening classes on November 16th and 30th or something. So I advertise them 
in my part-time resident class because it's always best to gather all the information that you can. Um, and Nikki Monroe there is very fun to listen to <laughs> as well. So, you know, if, if anyone wants to catch those classes, look up the Indian River County Extension and, you know, find where their classes on uh, snowbird gardening are. Now they're over on the East Coast, but, you know, you still pick up uh, practical ideas. Yeah, some of the things are, are sort of all over Florida tips, mm -hmm. right? Some basic right, sort of right. friendly stuff. And right. we have, um, we don't have any classes upcoming with the, you know, part-time or snowbird in the title, but we certainly have a lot of online classes uh, through November. And I think a couple in December, we start to slow down a little bit towards the holidays in December, but um, on Florida friendly landscaping topics. So if anyone's in our neck of the woods in, in Pinellas County or even Hillsborough County, they'll put my email. You can email me, of course, to find out what's going on. You can look on the Pinellas County Extension website. You can just Type that in your uh, search bar, Pinellas County Extension, and we've got a calendar and all kinds of info there too. So there's always something online these days. I can't even think. I know there's like a, there's a rain barrel class coming up not too far from now. Um, in Hill in Pinellas? In Pinellas, yeah. yeah. I don't remember the date though, so I'm not okay. gonna make it up. <laughs> Hillsborough's, having, Hillsborough's having one Saturday, and I think they're having a compost class tonight. I know this because I've had like three Hillsborough people ask to join mine and I'm like you're welcome to but you can also do this locally too so I've been sending them that information. Cool very cool. Yeah, yeah so people and anyone out there you know if you're in my neck of the woods or if you just have a question about about maybe something a little bit more I'm not gonna say tropical because we're really subtropical so uh, but yes. certainly write down my email address and you can always shoot me emails and questions and pictures later. Um, you know, if you think of something after an hour after we hang up and you think, oh, I meant to ask her about mangoes, <laughs> whatever, mm -hmm. let me know. <laughs> mangoes comes up every week. So. <laughs> oh, does it? Really? How funny. I didn't know that. <laughs> we get a lot of tropical fruit questions here. Yeah. Which I'm it's familiar with, although here in, you know, Hernando County, a number of them, I can't grow easily. We're a little bit. I was going to say because mango's going to get knocked back if you try that. That's not going to make it. Somewhere. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Although we do have them in the county, I've gotten emails yeah. before from somebody who said, "I just bought a house in Spring Hill. There's a tree in the backyard. What is it?" I opened the picture, and it's <laughs> a mango tree with with like a dozen beautiful mangoes on it. Nice. Oh my gosh! You consider yourself lucky. You're one of the lucky ones. They have a special microclimate there, I would imagine. Yeah. I can't mm -hmm. figure out how else it would survive. You said you have three or four freezes every year. Mm -hmm. They do not like that. I get one frost coming through here and all the mangoes look like they're about half dead. Now they usually survive it. They don't outright die, but yeah, it they also don't look depends. good. <laughs> it also depends on if it went from 90 to 20 in a day or if we or had- if it was more subtle. Yeah. Or hey, did you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, great. That is Annie's papaya leaf. Oh my gosh. That is more curled than I would have imagined. This is why pictures yeah. are so important. Can you see the second picture? Mm hmm. Huh. And okay, see, this is more what a guy was imagining when she said it, this third picture. Huh. Um, that's an, that's you know, very unusual. My first thought would be papaya ring spot virus. Oh, yeah, Although that's possible. I don't particularly see the ring spots on the leaf, but just well, I can't from the see it that unusual, close. So I'm not sure. Um, let's see if I can see a little bit closer on these. It may have papaya ring spot virus. It may. I can't, I can't tell for sure though. It's, I'm not a hundred percent by looking at those pictures, uh, but yeah. papaya it could explain spot. why the ones together have it and the one that's separate 
doesn't have it yet. Exactly. And that's probably spread by white flies. Probably. Right. They're such a common oh. pest. Yeah. So that's a virus that papayas can get. And a lot of times, unfortunately, it's very widespread all over South Florida, which is where you would normally grow papayas. And papaya plants don't grow for as many years because normally after a year or two or three, it's going to get the virus. And uh, it's kind of distinctive because the leaf or the fruit, it looks like people took a pen and wrote little commas all over it. Mm. And it gets real distinctive marking on the leaves and on the fruit, which from the pictures, it was a little hard to see if it had those markings. But usually from such... Um, that does not look right off top of my head like insect damage curling. That looks more like virus damage curling. It's pretty extreme, isn't it? Especially that one photo. So if you're so Annie, if your papaya does not outgrow it, then it's probably a goner. It's not going to do very well. And there's no chance that there was any herbicide overspray or anything around there, is there? Yeah, no, that's another good possibility. Any, if there was an herbicide used anywhere nearby, and chances are the most common one that either you or maybe your lawn guy would have used uh, would be Roundup or something like that. Or... Um, 2,4-D can travel right up the mile. I was thinking 2,4-D. <laughs> D would be the most likely one. I'm not saying yeah. that's it. I'm just putting out another yeah. option. Yeah. 2,4-D is, yeah, it often has drift issues. <laughs> and On a windy day, and we've, we've had dry, long windy long. days. Um, so one of those two things. I found I, I could pull up a, she says, possible herbicide from neighbor. I don't want to go <laughs> pointing fingers or anything, for no, sure. No, I mean, yeah. no. But it wouldn't, <laughs> also, it wouldn't just target your papaya tree. There should be something else. Along right. The way affected as is well. there a pattern there? Is there a yeah. pattern that you see that other plants are affected or if that's the only plant affected, then, then I'd stick with what Bill was thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting that out there as another possibility. And if it is herbicide damage, it should outgrow it then. Correct. Yeah. yeah. If it doesn't, if, if it, if the plant did not get hit with enough herbicide where it kills it outright, it will outgrow it. So the new leaves, maybe the next leaf won't look right, but then after that, the new leaves will look normal and healthy. If it has the virus, it's going to decline pretty quickly, and you'll know when it's gone. What about a weed and feed thing? Do you think that could have gotten into its system to do that? If she has them growing... Um, Were they in pots? I, I think I maybe saw them growing in a pot. Yes, they are. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're in containers. Okay. So, so that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be very likely, no. I hope so. I hope that that wouldn't have happened. <laughs> and she says she does have white yeah. flies. And white flies are notorious for uh, vectoring and spreading a lot of different viruses. So Roselle doesn't have any viruses that I know of. Although, technically, just about every plant in the world has some kind of virus that it is a host to. It may not damage it or kill it. It may do unusual things to it, but there are no serious Roselle viruses that I know of. Right. I'd be curious to know um, for Annie, since there are white flies in the landscape, you know, that she knows of, uh, does she know if there are beneficial insects around as well, trying to help control that? I don't know. She said she doesn't use any pesticides because it's part of or next to a butterfly garden. Yes, grass looks bad. If herbicide, will it recover? Hmm. Well, hopefully it should recover. And that depends on the um, volume of herbicide that landed hmm. on it. Because, you know, you don't have to spray things directly with an herbicide to get it damaged. If even if your next door neighbor or their service was out there spraying and there was just a slight breeze, these things can blow around and it just takes a little bit to land on certain plants to do a lot of damage. Yeah, but like you said, hopefully it would outgrow that if that's it. Mm -hmm. 
And that's just a, another thing to look for. Yeah. Oh, she's she got ladybugs. <laughs> well, that's good. That's really good. Cause I know that mm -hmm. for a while there, some folks get white flies so bad. They don't, it seems like a bit out of control, but I've noticed a trend at least around here, that most people who have white flies, um, and a lot of master gardeners I've talked to and seen their yards and stuff, sorry about that cat noise, um, they actually have a lot of beneficial insects. And so they found they don't need to do a lot to control the white fly. Usually the beneficials kind of swoop in if you, if you can afford to be patient, right? Of course, we don't want them spreading disease. Mm -hmm. But if you can afford to be patient, um, that can help keep them to a minimum. So the fact that she's not using pesticides is probably a good thing so that, you know, she doesn't have to do as much to control those white flies. But the other thing that we recommend if you do have a heavy white fly problem would be the, to use yellow sticky cards, which you can buy at garden centers or make yourself. Um, we use these a lot in the veggie garden, but if you have a real bad or uh, um, white fly problem on an ornamental plant, you can certainly use those as well. And they, the adult white flies, the ones you see that are little white insects flying around are attracted to that color and they stick to the board and it helps reduce their population uh, and without hurting the good bugs. Of course, you might have the occasional good bug fly also into it, get them, mm. but it's not, a, it's not a pesticide. It's another tool in the toolbox. That, it's not a Siamese cat, sorry. <laughs> He's an almost 20 year old all white cat and he is very vocal when he's hungry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. Summer just sent me two pictures and I got them. Can you help identify the plant? And let me try to screen share here again. Can you guys see that okay? Yep. Yeah. Can you read the email on there okay? No, it's too small. Oh, okay. <laughs> so she said, so Summer says, hello, I'm watching the virtual plant clinic on Facebook. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. I'm in Pinellas County in Dunedin. I wonder if you can help me identify this plant that showed up on my flower bed, pictures attached. This plant started growing in April and it's just recently put out this red tip that looks like the beginning of a bloom about two weeks ago. The whole plant is about 18 inches high. The pick has some canna lilies, but I'm interested in the yellow green leafed plant to the left. So if you can see the, the plant with the little red spear there, I think mm -hmm. here's a slightly better picture. Is it some kind of ginger? I was going to say, it looks like ginger. Maybe yep. it could be a, I don't want to say butterfly ginger. Does it have yellow, like, variegation in it or is it just the light coming through in the picture it I certainly looks like a type of ginger um i'm yeah, not sure which ginger it is from this photo but it certainly oh my looks gosh, like ginger. There, there are literally thousands oh. of different gingers or at least hundreds mm -hmm. many of which will grow just fine here some are edible a lot are ornamental mm -hmm. Identify. We've got a ton that will thrive in Pinellas County, and I could say for sure if you want to, when it flowers, send a picture of the flower, then we could get to the heart of which one it is, if that's important to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, give me a moment. I'll put Teresa's email back up there. So kind of wait and be patient. A lot of times this time of year, because it is the very end of summer, beginning of fall, almost winter, um there are certain gingers and other plants that don't flower until now so when it does if yeah. and when it does flower go ahead and send teresa a picture of it and she may be able to tell you what kind of ginger it is because there are so many different types of gingers and i know bromeliads is another group that oh my oh, god good gracious and we have it we have a gentleman i have a program assistant who like is an expert with bromeliads that's his specialty so we should have anyone a have a question uh, about that later <laughs> Yeah, we have master gardeners that are experts on bromeliads, gingers, and one who's an expert on orchids, Gary Geffen. And he is, we have him on Facebook Live on a regular basis. We call it the Gary Show or the Gary Geffen Orchid Show. And he'll go on, he'll talk about how to repot orchids and how to attach them to a piece of driftwood and hang it on the wall. It's almost, he made like 
a beautiful piece of artwork. I mean, he could have sold it at a store for I don't know how much and just did it, you know, live in front of the camera for Facebook Live. So that's really cool. Do you see, Bill, we're hearing from Citrus County? Yes. Well, I'm trying to, trying to get off of screen sharing there. Mm -hmm. um, my comments are hung up here. Oh, no. Well, BJ Jarvis says most gingers aren't considered edible. Don't eat anything unless you are certain. Oh, that's always a good reminder slash yeah. warning, yeah. always. Because just because a bunch of them are, you don't know that you have that one. <laughs> Thank you, BJ. <laughs> BJ is the uh, County Extension Director and Horticulture Agent in Citrus County. So, yep. And BJ is supposed to be a guest on here next week. So I guess she's become one of our regular viewers also. So if we have, yeah. we're going to have to start getting some of our regular viewers on here to be guest co-hosts or they can ask their questions live. We can do that. So we'll work towards that. Obviously, I figured out how to screen share here today. So if you have uh, a question job. <laughs> identified, if you email it to me, we can make that happen now. It just takes a little practice. I think um, with you being in control of the of the program um you can screen share better than you know us your co-hosts or something so when i try all it's doing is showing me what we're all looking at again <laughs> so and i saw that you have a couple <clears throat> different tabs to pick from at the top and no, if you pick bottom, a different tab on the bottom it says screen share but i don't know we can play with it sometime, maybe. So, I think Bill was frozen. There you are. Oh yeah, we've had all kinds of internet problems recently. We're going to different internet on Tuesday. They're coming to install it. So, so Summer said, could it be the same type of ginger I buy in the store? In theory, maybe yes, but also in theory, maybe no. Uh, and you don't want to find out by. Right. Standpoint. I'm assuming it's not the exact same thing. It's a relative. Let's well, put it that way. She said she planted that, though. She mm -hmm. planted that. So, but I still wouldn't want to take the chance unless you planted it in a pot and you know that's exactly what you put there. Oh, oh yeah. Right. So okay. Yeah. Well, still, I. Yeah, I would want to be sure. We actually get all kinds of questions and people bring us stuff. I remember somebody brought us. Um, a hickory in one day, uh, the nut, and it was a pig nut hickory. I don't know if you guys, you probably have those there, I'm we sure. Do. Yeah, we do. Um, we actually don't have them here in most of the counties, so really in just a few isolated areas where they grow well here. But they brought in the actual hickory nut, kind of packed open and some of the, the meat inside missing from the nut. And they put it on the table and they said, what is this? And we were like, you know, we started to look at it and asked about the leaves just to make sure we weren't imagining things. And he, had pictures of the leaves and stuff. And we told him, he said, yeah, I ate some of it yesterday. It, it tasted terrible. So I stopped eating it. And I thought, <laughs> first of all, I'm glad you stopped eating it because you should never taste or eat something until you know for sure. So first you identify and then you eat. And this guy did it all wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was lucky because those are, well, <laughs> I mean, those are technically edible. The squirrels like them, the pigs and the deer and the wildlife like them, but they're yeah. very bitter, very bitter. Not good and for people. Apparently, you can use them in a smoker grill. I know somebody that uses yeah. them. Yeah. I did them not know that. Yeah, grill. hickory, you know, flavor yeah. in the smoke. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's very common up here. All the uh, all the Hernando Countyans who've been here for generations, they do that all the time. So, so they use the actual nut in the smoker, yeah. not, the, mm -hmm. not just the wood. Right. That's very you could right. use the wood. Also, the wood's fine. Yeah. Right, right. But they'll throw some of the nuts in there with their charcoal or whatever. So. Oh, yeah. I just learned a fun new tip myself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bill, do you see what uh, BJ's saying there? This is one of your favorite topics of all time, isn't it? Yes. Our new oh. number one viewer, BJ Jarvis, <laughs> in the County Extension, asks, we had a client ask us how to control lizards and geckos. 
they don't eat plants and actually eat insects. Can the panel think of any reason to control them? If you want to set Bill on a rampage, ask to kill the lizard. Yeah. You may have gotten an email from the person that emailed us within the last few days that he is having a problem with lizards eating his vegetable plants, I think it was, and how does he control them? The lizards and geckos, technically they're anoles, mm -hmm. or we also have six line skinks here, although they're a lot rarer. But the really, really common ones you're going to see are going to be anoles. And they're the little lizards that run around your house. All they do is eat bugs and make babies all day long. They're not vegetarian, <laughs> not eating your plants. They'll, yep. You'll see them sitting on your plants a lot because they're looking for insects that are on your plants. And all they do, if you, you can sit outside um, by your uh, bushes and flower beds and just sit in a chair and watch them scurry around and do that all day long. But Very they, entertaining. You're yeah, not but gonna they go, not damage your plants. You're not going to go no. into a rant about living on the 11th floor in an apartment if you don't want to see geckos or <laughs> Okay, well, I've had to, and I hope we don't have too many uh, listeners who live in the villages over in Sumter County. But I've had, I generally go there once a year. I'm invited to go and give presentations at some of their clubhouses and they get a really good turnout, really good engaged group of people. But I almost always get the question when we get to, and it doesn't matter what I'm talking about. When we get the questions, one of the first questions is how do I get rid of those little lizards? <laughs> Why do you want to get rid of them? Cause they get in my, my pool and I up around my pool and you don't want to get rid of them because they don't hurt anything. Sure, they're going to get in your pool tonight. They'll get in your garage also. Do what I do. Get a cup and a cup on top of them. <laughs> get a piece of cardboard and slide it underneath. Take it outside. Set them free. Back in the bushes. But um, anything that eats roaches is a friend of mine. Oh, thank sure, you. I was just going to say that. Yeah. They, eat they all are the, the pest control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they eat all those things before they can get you know, into your house. But it seems like some people just want to sanitize their entire property. Hey, you know, if there's lizards, they got to go. If there's a snake, well, all snakes are poisoned, they got to go. <laughs> if anything, it's got to go. If there's a gopher tortoise in the hole, it's got to go. Although they're federally protected, people think their house is going to cave in and fall into the hole. There's some people who may want to think about living in a condo up on the 11th floor. If you right. can't handle living things around you outside of the walls of your house, think a house isn't the best way for you to go. Maybe you need a condo <laughs> where there, you don't have to worry about living things. It's true. And I have all of those things in my yard, including a couple of gopher tortoises, um, lots and lots of black snakes, which are wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, they startle me once in a while and you should always kind of, if you're gardening and you don't like these things, you want to kind of rustle the leaves, make some noise as you approach, you know, uh, be mindful of that. Cause I know some people just have sort of the heebie jeebies. They just get a little weirded out by some of these critters. Um, it's uh, so it's always good to sort of warn them that you're coming so that you won't be surprised either when you surprise them. <laughs> okay. They always surprise me. And if I'm, if I'm working in the yard, I'll walk around the corner of the house and I'm there and a snake is there and he jumps and I jump. Oh, yeah. I do my snake yeah. dance. Like two weeks yeah. ago, two weeks ago, I was in the backyard underneath a sable palm and I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't at all. And I had on flip flops and a snake jumped right on top of my foot. Mm. We both jumped. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not afraid of snakes, but you just don't expect that. <laughs> no, yes. I think I would jump and scream, even, even though I'm not yes. necessarily afraid of them. But, you know, that nature kicks in. And of course. Just, but And I think that's the instinct a lot of folks have about having cool. these things in the pool cages and in the houses. It's just that, ugh, this is out of place for me. <laughs> and... They don't understand it because if you move here from another state, you know, sure, our lizards are going to be a surprise, something you're not used to. Yeah. And a lot of the insects outside, uh, the lover grasshoppers, oh, they just terrify people. Oh, my gosh, there's a grasshopper and it's got to be like three feet long. Well, they don't get quite that large, but they are, you know, good. Two, three, it feels three, like three. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
and they seem to think that they're eating everything on their property when in reality they're not yeah there's a lot of things they really don't eat just because they're sitting on your bush doesn't mean they're eating your bush and it's it's yeah. just a little and do you have uh gold rain trees where you oh are? yes do you get the Jadera bugs in the spring oh yes oh my gosh for like a couple weeks in a row we just literally have a line of people at the office bringing them in in jars what is this little red and black bug? Um, yeah, come on oh, in. <laughs> how do I get rid of them? Get rid of that invasive golden rain tree. Well, what do I spray? Get rid of the tree. Well, what do I spray? No, <laughs> not the spray. answer. There's, there's I wish every invasive um, plant had a annoying insect like that because it really is my ace in the hole to convince people to get rid of the golden. Yes. Rain tree. They don't care that yes. the tree is invasive, but they care about those insects being there. <laughs> well, my favorite is they bring the insect in, right? And they don't, they don't, it was on their wall or their house or whatever. And mm -hmm. so the first thing you do is, oh, I see you have a golden rain tree. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. Like, You're like, how did you know? <laughs> yeah, because we are psychic. Yes. <laughs> psychic horticulture. <laughs> yes. Who are your neighbors? Your neighbors yes. have one. Because yep. I, we actually have a few in the spring in my yard. And I don't have a golden rain tree, but the neighbor across the street does. Mm -hmm. I'm in I'm in the same boat as you. Same thing. Neighbors got one, so they show up. They make their uh -huh. way over once in a while by accident, <laughs> or the wind blows them. And then palmetto bugs. Ew. Oh, I those agree. are rather unpleasant. They belong outside, and mm -hmm. I don't. I do not care for it when they come inside. And I love mm -hmm. my lizards, right? Primarily because they eat those. Um, yep. And do you guys have a hunts, huntsman spiders up there? I'm sure you must. Yes. Really big, yeah. oh, very yeah. large. So they eat cockroaches as well. And we had a very <laughs> large huntsman spider. Well, I'm sure we have several in my garage, but there was one in particular who kept showing him or herself to us. And I named him Fred. My <laughs> husband thought it was sort of disturbing and he wanted to shoo Fred away. And I said, you leave Fred alone. Fred yeah, is our free right. pest control service. That's right. <laughs> Exactly. And Fred was about two or three inches wide from tip to tip to stern or whatever. So he was definitely imposing. They can get quite large and we'll get pictures and calls on them sometimes. We have a tarantula. Yeah. Oh my God, Not, quite. <laughs> Not quite that big, but <laughs> yeah. That's another one I like I like to see. But if it's in the house, I do a build does. I put the cup over it, the piece of paper under the cup, and I say, all right, Fred, that's too close. We're going to move you back out in the garage or outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and sometimes you will get things inside of your house that just accidentally wandered in. They really don't want to live in your house. They don't want to breed and reproduce. And most of the roaches that we have here in Florida really prefer living outside in the decaying mulch where it's kind of dark and shady and wet all the time. So uh, it, it's funny because... If I'm with some other people with extension, like you know, Dr. Stacy Strickland and some other people, our county extension director, Jim Davis, if we see something like an Australian roach, which is what most people call palmetto bugs, we know it's just a stray that wandered inside. Unless you have a serious problem with, you know, a leaky faucet, or if you have a house like on the TV show Hoarders. Mm -hmm. This bill with paper and cardboard and wetness and things like that. They're not really living and breeding in your house. It just wandered in. So people will go into a panic if they see one. Oh, my gosh, I have to get the house treated and sprayed. Well, maybe, but probably not. Now, there are some like German cockroaches and Asian cockroaches. Yeah. They like living in your house. So if you, have them, <laughs> you can call a professional. Don't go to the store. Don't go to Walmart and get that big jug with a sprayer and try to do it yourself. You need to get professional help to get rid of them 100%. And yeah, you can do it. Yeah. put baits behind the light switches and all this kind of stuff to get rid of those. Yeah. Oh, I and got then some Australian roaches in our garage and I ordered online the baits. Oh my gosh, that bait works well. Mm -hmm. and it's, really easy. it's in a big syringe, it's kind of a brown goo. You just put some of it, and I put it in spots in the garage, and I checked back the next day. It was all gone, and it's done a wonderful job. So don't think that you have to always spray. A lot of times, identifying what your problem is, getting a, an appropriate bait that's going to work is a lot safer because we have dogs. 
I don't want to get spraying their water bowls and their food bowls mm -hmm. and spraying the entire house. But I can see behind things where the I get to it and work really well. So well, the other thing that you mentioned with like the hoarder type house is it doesn't even take that extreme a scenario. Um, you know, folks that are storing maybe magazines and newspapers or using yeah. cardboard boxes as long term storage. We don't really recommend that, especially in Florida. There's a number of insects that just really they really prefer cardboard and moisture and even some of the glues used in the cardboard mm -hmm. can be attractive. Uh, and so even if you're very neat and clean about collecting these things, sometimes it's best to go through those collections and um, minimize or get rid of the paper and cardboard, put things in yeah. plastic tubs, yeah. you know. Silverfish love those kind of things. Yeah, yeah so if you really want to control insects in the house, sort of organization, lots of airflow. You don't want spaces where I think give people, um, insects opportunities to hide and, and have those ideal spots. So that's really, really important. So you can be perfectly neat and clean but still have the wrong kind of collections of things too. Yeah, and keeping things very dry because a lot of these yes. things that need a steady source of moisture and that's what they're gonna look for. So if you give them moisture and rotting wood and cardboard and papers, sure, look in your house. I mean, if you roll out the welcome mat like that, they'll take advantage of it. But as a general rule, they really prefer living outside as opposed to inside. I was watching a neighborhood Facebook group, you know, for my neighborhood, and it seems that the people that were chatting back and forth, it seems like people come down and they are told you need to start pest control right away, like like setting up your mail, you know, it's just like something you need to do. It has to be done. And I'm like, man, we're the first owners of this home. But we've been here 12 years we've never had pest control ever once but on the other hand they think if they see any kind of insect you need pest control now we have spiders all over the house the occasional scorpion which isn't a good thing but you know we Ooh. watch for them and get rid of them but we don't have just an inherent roach problem because we live in florida you know i think people are misled that you live in Florida, you must have, you know, a company come out. If you begin to have a problem, like Bill said, you might want to call them out, but it's not necessarily, you know, a, a have to kind of thing. Yeah, a hundred percent. I have lived in Florida my whole life. And the only places I've ever lived that had regular pest control were apartments that okay. I rented in, in the college years. And I would, that was out of my control. And in apartments, it might be a better idea because you don't know what your neighbors are exactly. doing in terms yeah. of right. maintaining their spaces. Um, but I've never had to do that. And and right. people ask me uh, all the time, well, who would you recommend? We're not allowed to do that anyhow. But I try to explain to them that when you do all of the right things, you know, you might have the occasional bug coming in, you know, whatever. But this is not just a perfunctory thing to do. Right. And well, it does really, seem like they're sold that. Being in Florida, I've been here. 42 years and I know I'm not allowed to say I'm even semi-native because that annoys you natives I'm married to one um, but um but we just do things a little differently too we don't leave food out you know just instinctively and you know up north they're kind of more lax about that you know just that kind of thing and you don't need to be spraying your house once a month so yeah, and if you do have some kind of problem, it's so important to get it properly identified to know what you're dealing with. And so many people end up basically spraying or treating for imaginary insects. They just assume they have them. Like what you're talking about, you know, with just preventative treatments in your house and outdoors. People look at their bush or their hedges. That doesn't look right. It must have a bug. So I spray it. And, you know, maybe you did have a bug. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's a disease. Maybe it's, you know, a soil issue or a nutrient problem. And that's what, you know, us here at Extension, that's what we're here for is to help you figure out what's going on with those things. Or properly identify your problem because if we know what it is, we can come up for, an, for, for a solution that's actually going to work. So mm -hmm. I have a question here that Teresa put in the chat from Cindy Laporte, who I assume called the office or might be uh, watching us right now. How do you get rid of dollar weed in a flower garden? 
stop watering it. <laughs> but you know yeah. what? Uh, you you can, but I, I don't know about in y'all's area, but when you get dollar weed well established, you can stop watering it and you'll still have it. Yeah. Yeah. But she's right. It's an indicator you probably have too much water going there. Yeah, if you overwater, it will grow like crazy. It will be Love beautiful. It, it is yeah. edible too, by the way. Yeah. Dollar weed. Or just you, incorporate it, it into your into your bed. It's if you're not putting anything, weed. yeah, if you're not putting anything on it that would preclude you from eating it, of course. If there's right. no pesticides being applied in the area, it is uh, a native edible wildflower. Um, Penny wart. Yes, that's its other cuter name, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Without the word weed in it. Yes. <laughs> and it's a whole lot of torpedo grass. It is oh, I... a, summer, a summer annual, right? So it should be going down now. Yes, it'll get back to a large extent during the winter. Doesn't completely yeah, especially for you guys. Growing. Yeah. Yeah. And BJ mentioned a high water table can contribute also. So yeah. maybe you're not watering, you're not watering, but your um, your property is just naturally wet, or it could be a lot worse on top of a drain field because it's always getting that trickle moisture from your mm -hmm. septic. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think we're probably getting kind of close to the end here, but we, we see the have, there you go. Yeah. There we go. One more question. Carl asked, does anyone use crown of thorns, euphorbia, <laughs> for around windows or flower beds as a home protection measure? And oh, I'm Carl. sure people do. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that is really that. smart. I'm not uh -huh. going to break into Carl's house. <laughs> no, I actually have used um, sensory plants in that, in, that, in that way, outside of windows. Um, big pointy, nasty century plant thorns everywhere. And um, I mean, I certainly don't have a particular problem with people trying to sneak in windows or out of them, but they wouldn't. That would be very mm -hmm. effective. <laughs> Might be concerned though, if there's like a fire and that's your only way out. Uh, so you have to measure. Well, you know what though? You just take the scratches and go for it at that point, yeah, right? You just that. say. Yeah. <laughs> And another good substitute that's edible is blackberries. There you go. So oh. Older varieties of blackberry. Well, blackberries do well here in Hernando County. Do they grow down there? Or are you too far yeah, south? Or? We can, but we're pushing it. I you think know. North County would be like, I grow some in my yard, but it's not something I would necessarily tell everyone they ought to try here. They do well here. And we even have some people doing it commercially. We even have a certified organic blackberry farm here in the county. Ooh. And yeah. he does pretty well. <laughs> um, he had a problem with uh, parasitic algae a number of years ago, and it took him a, a, like a oh. year or two to, to get beyond that. It was spurred on by his property flooded. So he had oh. to put drainage and then fight it. But the last that I spoke with him and went out there and saw it, it was doing beautifully. But the old varieties of blackberries have lots and lots of scratchy thorns. So if you look for mm -hmm. something thorny okay. that you can eat, because they will grow here and grow blackberries, yep. that's a choice. So if you need to get a hold of our office, there is our phone number. And let me put Lily's email address here. And Teresa sent <laughs> me a comment that... Um, the lady who asked about dollar weed in a flower garden, Cindy, wants chemical control. So what kind of chemical control could you do? <laughs> and you are limited because most chemical controls that kill dollar weed are going to kill whatever kind of flowers it may be that it's growing in your flower garden. There. Right. So she's got pre-emergence that she could probably put out in like February, but tell me if my timing's wrong for y'all. Yeah, because yeah. dollar um, weed's a perennial, so that boat's already left. It has, but I think, I don't know, it could help it from spreading worse if she's going to try to pull what's there and partner that with the pre-emergent. I mean, you still have all the vegetative parts that are going to keep coming back if she doesn't dig them all out. 
Right. I don't know that we would, for me, it wouldn't probably be worth it, but it's an option. Mm -hmm. Not my a favorite one though, you're right. If you have a weed that's growing very, very close or even intermixed with your desirable plant, like I have holly hedges out front and gosh, I have skunk vine. I have, uh, <sighs> I have a creeper, which is an invasive, but it's still a weed growing in the bushes. There's mm -hmm. nothing I can spray to kill those vines without killing the bush. Right, because it's it's a broadleaf weed, but so are your desirable plants in that in that bed, or you know, whatever kills the broadleaf dollar weed is going to kill your other plants as well. So. Yeah, and then there's the other painstaking approach of a of possibly treating it with one of the products like a um, like a glyphosate product that is sort of applied paint paint style painted painted onto the dollar weed leaves. I don't know how extensive this situation is though. I mean, it's, this is at that point you're, you're as cumbersome as just hand pulling and hand removing yeah. in yeah. my opinion. And right. so then I would go back to that. If I'm going to on my hands and knees anyways, I might as well pull it up. Pull it and maybe smother out, use something to smother out that area for a while. Yep. Put some yeah. cardboard down under the mulch maybe where it's growing a lot and then just mm -hmm. try to get ahead of it really yeah. persistence, right? That's what we tell people with weed control is persistence. Yeah. I, I tell people <laughs> that, you know, if you're persistent and you keep on top of it, you'll win. Eventually it may take a while. Yeah. And you're going to have to be persistent. Don't do like bill and let the skunk find grow through the hedges until it gets to the point where it flowers. Ah, uh, pull it early and pull it off. And yep. <laughs> pulling skunk find is good stress release. I go. suppose, right? <laughs> and we can all day. use that these days. We can all yeah. use some stress relief. So um, weeding. Well, that'll be our gardening for wellness tip of the day. <laughs> and you know, today it looks like a beautiful day outside. Very pleasant yes. temperatures up here. So it's a good day to go out there and pull that dollar weed out of your yeah. <laughs> if I had dollar weed, which I'm surprised I don't because the neighbor does because he likes to water but but it doesn't make it into my dry sandy area but i think i would be like oh yeah okay well now i have dollar weed i'm going to incorporate it into yep. this because it is a native and it does have value i actually have a neighbor around the corner who has a bed the um, area between the sidewalk and the road that terrible strip that's always a pain in the you know what to maintain yes, yes. there's a whole section of it that is all dollar weed and match weed or, or fog fruit as Ooh, some yeah. might know. Yeah, we have plenty of that it's gorgeous it yeah. looks so much better than their lawn i would and they mow it periodically just like the lawn and there's yeah. butterflies yeah. all over it yeah, yeah. I'm like, I want to order that, but my yard is just dry and sandy, so it wouldn't be happy in my yard. But I would love that. It's the, the match weed would. Match weed would be yes. something. And I have yeah, some of that mixed in with other yard. things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have anyway. plenty. I didn't put it there. Nature put it there. Yep. <laughs> and I don't. Yep. I mean, why would I fight it? There's three different types of butterflies that yep. are attracted to that. And, and it's adorable. It's just little. Yeah. You have to get close to see how cute it is. Yeah. <laughs> and it has like, Many names. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> My Match favorite. Fruit, frog fruit, frog fruit, turkey tangle frog fruit. <laughs> that one's my favorite. Turkey yeah. tangle frog fruit. <laughs> yes. It sounds like a dance. It does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me check. There we go. Annie, you are mm -hmm. very welcome. Hopefully, you'll be back you, Annie. again next week. We will be back here, or I will be back here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. I see Lily will be also. Yep. And I believe that we're scheduled to have B.J. Jarvis, who is a county extension director from mm -hmm. Citrus County, just one county north of here next week. So, so you can get the, the – and they get even colder than we do up there. So you can kind of get a little idea of uh, – uh, the temperature variation from north to south, from Pinellas to here to Citrus. Yeah. Yeah. And I think That's she's awesome. talking about the uh, match head weed is water conserving and low maintenance as well. Yes, it really is. It is. It'll grow. I've seen it grow in wet areas. I've seen it grow in very dry, sandy areas. It is very, very durable. And I even mm -hmm. see it growing. The end of my road is the Gulf of Mexico. It grows even in a uh, saltwater tidal mm -hmm. area. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. You know? It gets yeah. flooded periodically there, and at very high tides are king tides, and 
it's fine. It's happy as can be. Cool. See, yep. stuff. That's a good yeah. point to because salt tolerance is really important for people who live mm -hmm. right on the coast. Yep. If you, yep. you don't and want to fill your yard with salt intolerant plants because even just the, the salt air and the occasional breeze or a storm blowing out of the west is going to be. You'd be surprised. I didn't think it was that salty, but on certain days where it's very dry and windy, uh, yeah. we're probably seven houses away from the water here, but my windshield will still have little salt crystals on it some days. Yeah. And yeah. you think, well, that's weird, but on the in the right conditions, it will it will aerosolize and spread far there than you think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, hey, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, thank you, Lily, for helping out once again. And Teresa, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us. We'll have to have Thanks for having me. That was fun. I yeah. love talking with you guys, and uh, let everyone know to email me with questions, pictures, um, you know, down in the Pinellas County area, so I'll be happy to help them with the, whatever they're growing. <laughs> okay. Well, great. Hey, you guys hold on for just a second and let me tell everybody else until next week, we'll see you again really soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.